Today we're talking about, <coughs> and I think it's appropriate, the communion legacy. I'm going to talk about the, the legacy of communion, and we're going to share communion with you today as a church family. But let's go together. Paul writes to the church at Corinth some very, very uh, interesting thoughts. And I want to get into the, the history of that and the context of it so that we can get a deeper revelation and understanding as to why is Paul talking to the church at Corinth about these issues. Anybody interested in that? Just the pastors are? Come on. Remember, we reinstituted the amen. And remember what happens if you say amen? My, my sermons get shorter and shorter. So how about an amen? All right, we'll get a short sermon in today. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord, this is Paul writing, that which I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, not religious observation. Did you notice that there? In the same manner, he took the cup, here we got it here today, after supper saying, <coughs> excuse me, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, you are doing a religious service of obligation. No, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, think about what Paul is saying. God told him, Jesus told him, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So by you and I partaking as a community in, the sac in, 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 in communion together as a community, the bread, which represents the body of Christ, and the blood, or, the, or the, the cup, which represents his blood of the new covenant, we are proclaiming something as a community. Yes, you do it as individuals, but when we do it together as a community, we are proclaiming the death of the Lamb. Think about it. So why was it so important that Paul had to share this thought with the church at Corinth? Let's go to history because it's really helpful. History explains to us that during this time, it wasn't right after Jesus' death, this is years after now, that the the sharing of communion turned into a festival in the church. It turned into the 4th of July. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, sometimes we observe holidays, <coughs> 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, Martin Luther King Day, Grandpa Day, Grandma Day, Sunday, Sister Day. We, f we figure out days just to celebrate. And sometimes as we're celebrating, we're working our way towards those holidays. Even Easter's like that sometimes. We got the bunnies and we got the eggs and we're doing all kinds of Easter egg hunts and that's fine. I'm not making fun of that. But in doing a lot of things, sometimes the, the coming together and, and feasting becomes the focus instead of the legacy of the event. It's mankind's way. It's how we do life. We forget things. So the church was forgetting the purpose for the Lord's Supper, and they started, it became this, this, believe it or not, this high society thing in the church where rich people were saving tables, bringing in the better food, and not allowing the poorer people to join with them, and made them feel like second-class citizens because they didn't have the resources that some of these other folks had in the church of Corinth. Did you even know this? It's crazy stuff, right? Check your history. This is what happened. And it became a festival. It's sort of like on the 4th of July. Sometimes we even forget independence. What is it? You got to remind ourselves. What, like, why are we celebrating the 4th of July? Well, of course, we celebrate 4th of July because you get hot dogs and hamburgers until you can't eat anymore, and then you drown yourself in your pool. That's what, that, and drink as many beers as you can. That's the 4th of July. Remember, I go quicker when you say amen. You're like, I'm afraid to say amen, because pastor, are you saying you're pounding beers on the 4th of July? No, I'm not. Don't worry. Don't worry. I haven't lost it completely yet. Thank you, Jesus. 
But we celebrate events, we celebrate things, and we forget the legacy and the purpose of the event, the power of the reality of it. And that's what happened. So Paul had to remind them, the reason that you do this is you are preaching. You are not having a festival. You are preaching. We as a community, as we come together, it becomes a solemn time, a holy time. It's not a time for drinking and carousing. It's a holy time. It's not a time to show that you have greater wealth than somebody else. It's a holy time, and it reminds us that we are all equal around that supper table. And the thing that we all have in common is the death of our Savior. And that's why we do this in common. And as we drink the, the, the cup and eat of the bread, it's just a symbol. It's not his body. It's not his blood. It's a symbol of everything that he did to cause us to come together and the wrath of God to be off of us as individuals. It's preaching the power of his death. I mean, you're saying, wow, yes, so we could. So as often as you do this, it's very important that we're reminded of the power of this legacy, of the authenticity of what Christ did. So it doesn't become, and I said this last Sunday, and it's been riveting me all week. So it has to become more than black and red ink on pages of a book. And when we get away from the purpose of the things that we celebrate, it becomes just that, a, a story. It becomes, you know, oh, legend says this happened and that happened instead of being an authentic personal interaction relationship with the risen Christ. That was a good time to say amen, too. Paul had to remind them, I'm reminding you today. I'm reminding you today. Did that mean that they were bad people and going to hell? No, it meant that all of us sometimes lose our memory and lose the focus on why we're even here in the first place. That's why church people fight with each other, and they get angry with each other, and they have unforgiveness with each other, because we forgot the reason we came here in the first place was to lay our lives down to serve Christ. That's why he said, if you're coming around the communion table, examine your heart. See if there's anything in you, so you don't eat of the, the Lord's Supper in an unworthy fashion. Are you, are you following me? Because that's a really a holy moment. It's a holy time. And I need to remind you of that like Paul did. Major events, sacrifices made by people for us, special places, even the blessings of God at times. Think about a blessing that you've had in your life that's been amazing. Sometimes what you're facing today so overpowers and overshadows the blessings that God has done for you in the past. It's like you forget. You, if you just remind yourself of that, God did it then, he's going to do it again. He's the same God. We just sang about it. Isn't he amazing? How easy we forget. You know, I like to do research, so bear with me. Elizabeth Kensinger is a neuroscientist, and she wrote an article in the Harvard Gazette, Why We Remember and Why We Forget, and What Can We Do About It? Interesting thought, isn't it? Because there's certain things you want to forget, but there's certain things as far as legacy that you should not forget. Jesus' communion legacy is something we need to never forget and often remind ourselves of. Look at this article, just a portion of it. At the most basic level, we want to think about memory as having three different phases that must happen for us to have access to past content. The first is to get the information into memory, a process that's referred to as encoding then you must keep that information around. And this is called storage or consolidation. It's akin to pressing the save button on a document that you've just created on your computer. But unlike that analogy with a computer, you must continually restore that content in the brain. And then finally, you must be able to bring that information to mind in the moment you need it. 
memory failures can reflect errors at any of those different stages. One of the most common times when errors arise is in the initial encoding phase, where often what happens is that we're not, we're just not devoting enough effort or paying enough attention. <laughs> That's why Jesus told the disciples as they celebrated the Passover, do this often. And when you do it together, remember me. Keep encoding in your memory banks who I am and what I've done for you. Keep encoding in your memory banks, banks the authenticity of the power of my death, burial, and resurrection. Keep putting that inside of you. And sometimes we, as human beings, we lose memory because of those very reasons. God knows more than a neuroscientist because he created your brain. They're just finding out now about this encoding. Well, Jesus knew about it sitting at the Last Supper, and he was trying to get us to practice a practice that would help us to stay fresh with the legacy of his communion and proclaim his death until he comes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. The original communion. Jesus uttered these words at the last meal he shared with his disciples before his death. It was the Passover, a time during which the Jews commemorated their escape from slavery in Egypt and it was an important meal. Could you imagine how solemn that meal was? As all of Israel celebrated, what were they celebrating? Sometimes we even lose that. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm sure some, some Jews lose the power and authenticity of Passover, of Hanukkah, of their, of their holidays, because it becomes a festival like we, like ours as well. But what about the power of the reality of what happened? You do remember that God spoke to Moses after all the plagues that have gone through Egypt, and he's like, I'm done, and now I'm coming for the firstborn in Egypt. And since you all live in Egypt in a land called Goshen, you better listen to what I'm telling you to do. You need to go out and find a lamb from your flock, <clears throat> maybe you have a little hobby farm and you need to go find a lamb that looks pretty good, doesn't have a lot of blemishes in it and you need to slaughter that lamb and you need to put blood and apply it to the doorpost and the lintel of your home. Why? Because the death angel, the judgment of God is coming through Egypt. I gave them many opportunities through many plagues, but the death angel is coming. Please warn the people that they must follow this regulation. They must observe this uh, c commandment that I'm giving you. And as they do, they're going to hear the death cry all through the land of Egypt, but the death angel will pass over your home. Wow, they remembered that. They remembered the favor of God, the blessing of God, the, the Passover, and they celebrated that. <coughs> Jesus gathered his friends together before his death and his passion to celebrate the Passover. We, we just talked about it last week. But there's a difference in this Passover. The Passover that we're talking about, communion, is not somebody's hobby farm barn animal. Are you following? It's not some good-looking animal. It's the Son of God selected by his Father giving his very best. It's a person that requires more of us than a fond memory of a pet that we had in the past. It requires a commitment and a passion and a dedication as a community 
to a person. That's the difference between Passover and the legacy of communion. Wow. Exodus 12, 21 and 27. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, pick out and take lambs for yourself according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. Oh, I don't want to lose my animal. Okay. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out the door of his house until morning for the Lord, the Lord, the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the doorpost, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing uh, as an ordinance for you and for your sons when? Forever. It will come to pass <coughs> When you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he's promised, that you shall keep this service. Listen to this. It's about memory. It's about encoding. I don't need to go to church. You do. It's about getting your memory encoded. You have so much code being uploaded into your brain during the week that's opposite and anti-Christ. You need to be in the house of God to continue. Yes, do it at home, but you need to come together as community as often as you do this together. That even made my cough feel better, that one. It'll come to pass when you come into the land that the Lord God give you that you'll keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what's Martin Luther King Day, Lord? Dad, what's the 4th of July? You shall say, this is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel, Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians and he delivered our households. Wow. So the people bowed their heads and they worshiped. There's a solemn attitude when you have a revelation of what communion is about, you bow your head in homage. You bow your head in humility. You bow your head in commitment and honor to a God who would care enough about you, not just to sacrifice his little pet, but to give us the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. Wow. 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 First Peter says it this way in, in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things or barn animals, like silver or gold or someone paying off your debt, from your aimless conduct received by the traditions of your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, the perfect lamb. He never sinned. I hope this doesn't get old, like an old storybook that sits on the shelf in your home, in your library, and it's an old book, and it's dusty, and the corners are kind of cracking from being so old. I hope it is alive in you, written on your heart. Amen? For the word of God is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides the marrow from your bone, your soul and your spirit. It shows the intents of the heart. Oh, a book is to entertain you, but the word is to expose the intents of our heart. Thank you, God. Revelations 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. John 1, 29. And the next day, John saw Jesus. Who is this lamb of God? How do we know, according to Revelation, that Jesus is that lamb? Well, John, the next day, sees Jesus coming toward him and says, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world.
Look at Hebrews 9.19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and water, scarlet wool, hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Look at this. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And here it is. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or remission of sin. As often as you do this, you proclaim my death. When people are walking away from the reality of a true living God and following science and following, you know, the earth and following new thought, new theology, new, new mindsets, new ways of thinking, as, as people are starting to and continuing to roam away, from the orthodoxy of the scripture, which still remains the same as without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the... And he is the... No man can come to the Father except through him. And when we come together in this day and age and we do this as a community... It's preaching louder than talking about earthquakes and events and talking about theology. It's saying they really believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They really do believe that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. They really do believe they have peace with God the Father. They really do believe that Jesus is alive forevermore. He was dead, but yet he's alive and he holds the keys to hell and death. We really are preaching that in the midst of a culture that sees us as naive and, and maybe just a little religious, we're preaching to them so that when these events happen, they come to you and they ask for the hope that you have inside. Because at the end of the day, when your house is rocking back and forth and it sounds like a tractor trailer ran through your attic in your home, and you don't feel secure. Anybody got a witness today about that? You have a hope on the inside of you. You may get a little startled, but there's another party that looks up and says, wow, my redemption draws closer. Eternity is coming. You might get a little shook, but how about somebody that does not have a reality? Oh, please, somebody walk with me today who doesn't have a reality, a real, tangible, authentic relationship with the person of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slayed before the foundations of the world. What do they do in those moments? The Bible says, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies inside of you. You say, how am I doing that? When you do communion together as a church family, as often as you do it, you're preaching. Because what you do speaks so much louder than what you say. Did you catch that? The days of devotion are coming back to the house of the Lord. The days where people are devoted to the word and to the person of Jesus. It's coming back. It's coming back. You don't have to make it happen. Just be a part of it. And give an answer for those that ask the hope that's inside of you. How are we doing with time? Oh, good. What's the purpose of this? Legacy, Luke 22, 15 to 19. And he said to them, with desire, I have desired to eat Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and he gave it thanks. He broke it 
And he gave it to them saying, this is my body. He wasn't saying this is physically my body. This is representing my body, which is given for you when you do this together. Remember me. If it was about an animal, you're not remembering some old past Paschal lamb that you had. How many have ever had lamb for Easter? We used to do that. The next day, unless you're nauseous, you forgot about that beast, did you not? But you can never forget because Jesus Christ is a person. And he's looking him in the eyes and saying, forget about Passover lambs. Remember me. Encode yourself with me so that I don't become a religion and so that you don't get lost in sacrifices and religious obligation when I have so much more for you to do. You're going to need the power of the authentic reality of who I am in your life to be a witness until I come. That's what he was saying. He's saying, remember my pain. We watched The Passion again. I hadn't watched it since it first came out in the movies in 2000, was it? 24 years ago. It was the last time I watched it. I watched it again, and I wept. Me, Linda, and Natalie, I wept watching it. Maybe we need to watch it every year. Or maybe we need to watch it every time we take communion. Why? Remember the pain that he went through. This was not some kind of a you know, nice little neat meal here. He suffered. He died. He was brutally beaten. I have the medical report. I'm not going to read it today. It's too, it's too close to Easter. I'll read it to you in another communion on what Jesus actually suffered for the six hours on the cross and everything leading up to it through the Garden of Gethsemane, the emotional turmoil, the physical turmoil, the spiritual separation, all that he went through. He's saying, remember me when you do this. That's why it can't be the 4th of July Hamburgers and Hot Dogs Festival. This is a solemn moment, a holy thing. Yeah, I said holy. We could say holy in church. It's a holy thing. Man, it's holy. And as I watched the Passion of the Christ and all he went through, I wept about our holy Lord going through this for me. Remember my sacrifice. He didn't just talk about surrender and yield and doing something for us. He followed it all the way through and said, Tidalestai, into your hands I commend my spirit, Lord. I think the first weekend in May, I'm going to talk about, I did this about 10, 15 years ago. I studied the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross. And a month from today, get ready, bring friends, because you can't hear those sayings and not respond. Bring friends to church that day. Yeah, give them a free cup of coffee after I'm, I'm pastor, but bring them to church to hear the seven sayings that Jesus spoke before he gave up the ghost. Remember my love, and I love this. He was telling them to remember him together and the power that the preaching of the gospel that comes through us as we do this together. Someone say amen. amen. What was the price? I'll do this quickly. Precious royalty and the spilling of royal blood. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious, say precious, say precious, precious blood of Christ as a lamb <coughs> without blemish and without spot. It also cost the cross. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you and me, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven. Someone say, thank God he forgave me. All your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. We were guilty. And he has taken it out of the way why and how? What was the price? 
nailing it to his cross for six hours. It caused shame, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There was shame to it. And I thought about this last week as I was talking during the Easter um, service. And I like to ask myself questions like, Jesus, what were you actually thinking about on the cross? Were you thinking about the pain? Were you thinking? No. Yes, he was in pain. But the scriptures always gives us insight to the questions that we have. What was he thinking about? You. Oh, come on, pastor. He was thinking about me. He was thinking about you in agony for six hours when he was mocked, shamed, naked, embarrassed. It said, for the joy that was before him. What was that? You and I. He endured the pain and the shame of the cross. He was thinking about you. That has to do something to you. It has to do something to me. That's why when Paul was, now you understand. See, I love putting pieces together because now do you understand why Paul was like, <laughs> dudes, you're having the 4th of July here. Like, this is not about, you know, outdoing somebody's meal here. This is about preaching his death. It cost his life, Romans 5, 6, and 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Was anybody ungodly? Here I was. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? He didn't just talk about going to breakfast. He's like, he gave his life for us to eat. What was provided? We're going to end here. Someone said, oh, I'm going to go another four hours. You're not helping me here. Amen. There you go. It provided peace with God and access to grace. I could preach six weeks on that, but I'm just going to give you a verse. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, ha -ha, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also, it's not just peace with God, we have access by faith into this grace in which you stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What are we saying? <coughs> What we're saying is the Passover lamb was a, a focus for the wrath of God. You listening? There was wrath. Wrath needed to be satisfied. There was a Passover lamb. That wrath was satisfied Therefore, Israel was not destroyed because they had peace with God because there was an object of wrath called a Paschal lamb, the, the Passover lamb. Now, this isn't somebody's dog we're talking about. I love my dogs, but come on, somebody. I cry my dog dies, but this is, if I cry over a dog and I forget Jesus, what has happened to us? What is happening to us? What is happening to us? What is happening to us? I'm here to remind you, like Paul reminded Corinthians, we're doing something holy here. We're doing something sober here. Just like they had peace with God, now we're justified and we have peace. Listen to what I'm saying. The wrath of God is coming. You didn't hear that before in the Bible? In, the, in Revelations, in Thessalonians, it talks about the wrath to come. Wrath is still coming. We're in dispensation of grace right now. 
but you are saved from the wrath of, to come, and you have peace with God. The destroyer is not going to touch you or your family. That's why we have to do this together and preach his death so people understand, yeah, destruction's coming, but you're going to live for eternity. You have peace with God. God is not angry with you anymore. Wrath is not hanging over your head. There's no death sentence over you anymore. I don't have to preach to get you happy about that. I don't have to raise my voice. You just know inside of you, the Holy Spirit is saying something today. Communion legacy. And he also says, not only do you have that, now, okay, you're not only under wrath, now you have access to grace. <coughs> so I'm down. We've got to do grace. We've got to talk about grace. Grace is God exerting his holy influence on the soul of mankind. What does that mean? I'm saved, yeah, but what is this grace thing? This grace gives me the strength to say no to sin. It gives me the strength to live for God a disciplined life. It gives me strength to tap into the anointing for living for God and serving God, but also protection when things like earthquakes hit your town. It's his grace that saves us, preserves us. It's his grace that empowers us. It's his grace that changes us and sanctifies us. It's his grace that helps us lead this walk all the way through. Yeah, but you don't know, Pastor. I don't know yours, but you don't know mine. You really don't want to walk in my shoes for more than a week, trust me unless you're graced to do it. But when you're graced to do it, it's a, ble a blessing. It's a pleasure. Freedom from the curse, Galatians 3. Look at this, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That means there was a judgment and there was a curse on you. Having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I'm telling you right now, Balaam had to hear from a donkey that you cannot curse what God has blessed. I'm certainly not a donkey, and I'm not listening to a donkey, but I'm listening to a lamb. His name is Jesus, and he is telling me that I'm blessed. And he's telling you that you're blessed. And what God has blessed, no man can curse. The curse of the law has come off your life. I think you need to get happier than that. The curse of the law has come off your life. What else has it provided? Lastly, but not least, salvation. Acts 4, 11 through 12. And this is why we need to understand in the culture that we live in, there's a lot of different ideas, a lot of different ways to God. And, you know, you can kind of levitate and meditate and everything's going to be fine. I have people that have told me these things that have known God for a lot of years. And instead of judging them, I listen to them and I love them. That's what the Lord has, has instructed me. Don't fight them because they know every scripture that you do. Don't fight. They want to fight you. They want you to get into it with them. Look, and I have to be honest with you. I'm not a theologian, but I've been in this book long enough that if someone starts talking, 15 verses are already in there. I spent my life in the Word. So I live my life according to the Word, and if I hear something that's error, I know it's error. I don't have to point it out to you every 30 seconds, though. That becomes, I've seen this. In this culture, it doesn't, doesn't work. But guess what's happening now? This was happening five years ago. The person's starting to call me and telling me that, you know, they're going through depression and feelings that they've never had. Yet, five years ago, this was the newest thing, the amazing thing. They can just think things, and things are coming to them, and it's a beautiful thing. And wow, look, it's all spirit. It's all one thing. How is it working out for you? I'm never going to say I say so. I said so. But I'm always going to try to act like Christ. He was denied. He was rejected. He came unto his own. His own received him not. But to as many as received him, he gave them the power to become sons and daughters of God. Stick with the truth because it always come back to the foundation. With that in mind, this is the stone which 
was set at naught. It's not cool anymore. Christianity's not cool anymore. It's cooler to have some kind of Eastern spin and mix it all together in my jambot of religion. <laughs> Give me the jambot at the vegetables with a little chicken or something in it. I don't need jambot of religion. I found the truth. His name is Jesus. <laughs> Which has become the head and the corner. Neither, neither, neither. Neither is there salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You don't have a choice. These leaders of religious persuasions did not give their lives like the lamb gave his life to be slain. There's no other name. There's no one else worthy. There's no one else who said to John on the island of Patmos when he fell dead at his feet, he said, John, I'm alive. I am alive. I was dead, but I am alive and alive forevermore, and I hold keys to hell and to death. There's nobody else. There's no other name. There's no one else you can find. You want to be saved. You want to have peace with God. You want your mind to stop racing. You want depression to be out of your life. I have to tell you something. You can't live in, a, in extended places of peace, restoration, and soundness of mind without the peace giver himself, the prince of peace. His name is Jesus. There's no other one you can run to. You must run to him. You must. You must hear this preacher. You must run to him in these last days. He will restore your soul. He'll take the wrath of God off of your life. He'll bring you peace in relationship with the Father, and he'll extend his grace to you, the ability that you need to live a victorious life. <coughs> Someone say amen, or I'll go on four more hours. Greek in the word saved is sozo, and in the other, in salvation is soteria. We've taught this before. But just to, to get it in your mind, do this in remembrance of me. It means deliverance. It means preservation. It means safety. It means salvation. It means safety. It meant safety to me this week when my house sounded like it was going to explode. I have safety. Do you know the Bible says, oh, that's old stuff. You're talking the old Pentecostal people now. No, I'm talking Bible. The Bible says that God has his angels surrounding anyone that fears God. Uh, that fear of God stuff is it's too much. You guys are too hokey. You're too extreme. Okay, how's that working out for you? I would rather trust God and at 17 or 18 when I should have been dead when I was driving through the Giants parking lot and my car somehow went through a steel or metal linked fencing, whatever that was, I should be dead. I'm not because his angels surround me. Whoever thought an earthquake would hit Tewksbury, New Jersey, not me. And I know you guys felt it as well. It's not all about me, but I never thought that way. Whoever thought that way, but it came to my house. But he gives his angels charge concerning me. That I will not even dash my foot against the stone. A thousand will fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but it will not come near me. Anybody know the word today? Anybody holding on to the word today? You're going to need to know the word to know the promises that you have. So do this. Do this. As often as you do. Remember I'm a person. Remember me. Remember my pain. Let the encoding go so deep into your spirit. Nothing shall separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. 
not famine, not death, not peril, not the sword, not principalities or powers, no, no other thing, no high thing, low thing, nothing, 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 nothing. How could these apostles except John be murdered for the gospel, some hung upside down, how could they do, how could you die? Because once you know him, nothing can separate you from him. Nothing, nothing, nothing. But I don't like the way they do this in church. Oh gosh, you are so, oh man, you're thinking on the wrong things. You're thinking about the 4th of July. Wait a minute, but isn't that, Newton? modern church is different. Well, it might be, we may do it differently, but it's still founded on the same principles of death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And we need community together to remember him together, to proclaim his death till he comes together. Amen.